Okay, I just want to give you a little bit of idea of what we're going to be doing here in week five and six as we go through the last couple of readings. And what I've done is I've trimmed down the American reading, um, but I want to give you a clear taste of how American literature is different than what was going on on the other side of the pond in England. Okay, you've already got a decent taste with Beowulf and with uh, Shakespeare's Twelfth Night, how their literature was developing. Um, we're not going to go into 19th and 20th century British literature, um, which can be interesting, but um, we are going to go into 19th and 20th century American literature. And we're going to go at two things that are dramatically different um, from what our British counterparts were doing, um, because this class is focused on what the English language contributed um, to literature. And the two primary locations that English was active in literature were England and America. Okay, the two primary. But far from, uh, you know, complete. In other words, many other countries were contributing in other ways towards English literature. Australia, um, Trinidad, all these uh, other countries throughout the world, South Africa, were contributing literature um, to the English language. And but we're going to focus on what we have focused on is England. Now we're going to jump over to America. And a few things happened um, with the English language in literature once in the United States. Um, the Puritans, now they set it up and they got things going with the English language in North America. Um, but things would start to develop along very different lines. And that really got going with two poets who started doing things that were not seen before in England. Okay, so the Puritans were doing very much a British type of literature, British type of writing, poetry primarily, and Bradstreet and others were writing in the English language, and a lot of it is it's quite similar to what they were seeing um, coming over from Britain. Um, two poets really innovated the U.S. approach. Um, one was uh, Emily Dickinson, where she has a poetry that is entirely turned inward and it's very critical of who she is and it gets into the distorted um, fractured sense of self that she had and a very important element of hers is that she wrote her poetry and I think some of her poetry was published in her time but absolutely nobody knew of her as a poet uh, she was a very reserved woman who was very private and separated off from her social world around her. And so again, you get that sense from her poetry that she was looking inward. And she was not really understood as a significant poet until the 1930s uh, when a critic came across, a professor came across um, many of her unpublished poems and went, my goodness, this is extraordinary um, what she's doing it hadn't been seen anywhere in the world before she had long since passed and in the 1930s when it, when her first works were really published as excellent pieces of poetry um, she was recognized in the coming decades as a great american writer um, but now mind you in her time she was not a figure of much importance at all nobody really knew her her poems had been published a little bit in a volume of her poems had come out but nobody really cared um, and again what he found what the um, professor found was he found poetry that was very challenging and that's what i've given you here were selections um, from her poems that are quite odd i will be going through them in the coming days in more detail and give you a sense of how they kind of seem to work um, the other poet of the time was walt whitman who was very public and publicly known and he was the embodiment of American poetry. There were other poets such as Longfellow and others um, but they did not have the kind of lasting influence over American literature and nor were they really as dramatically original as Walt Whitman was. The world had not seen somebody writing poetry the way Walt Whitman did. Um, this expansive, um, his notions of democracy included everybody. And you're going to see elements in his poetry where he's including, um, you know, something today that wouldn't seem as shocking or so, um, including African Americans in a sense of who he is, including women in his sense of who he is, 
in including gays and uh, lesbians and homosexuals in his sense of who he is. Um, he was bringing people in who had been excluded um, from a sense of citizenship in the United States into his poetry. And so it's a radically different type of poetry than you see in Dickinson, who was turned in and finding a fractured sense of self. And Whitman unifying with his expansiveness and bringing people into his unity by going outward. Okay, And so you'll see this. Let me shrink myself up and show you where the poems are. Here's the front page. and We all know that one. And if you go to the um, pages, well, lo let's go to the modules. I'll show you where it is. If we go over here to the modules, I'll turn the pages on momentarily. In week five, and I'll have more videos added to this in the coming days. Um, here are the poets, okay? And this is a selection um, of both. There's Whitman, excuse me, here's Whitman and here's Dickinson. And you'll first get these poems um, from Walt Whitman. And the famous poem that he's known for um, is O Captain, My Captain, um, which is a poem he wrote about uh, Lincoln's death. Um, he did wish that he'd never had written that poem, and I can't disagree with him because I honestly think that is pretty bad stuff. Okay, um, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed is on the same subject, um, the death of Lincoln, um, and you're going to see a far more sophisticated poem mourning the loss of President Lincoln. And again, he's a very public poet, and he saw his work and his calling as being a public calling, okay? And you'll see that throughout, his expansiveness, the line forms, um, the power of his, uh, you know, of his poetry as he goes through. It's very much kind of a thundering, here we are, um, this is democracy, and, you know, it's a very expansive type of poetry. And then what you'll see in Emily Dickinson is a very different approach. Um, hope is a, uh, is a thing with feathers that perches in the soul. And so she's talking about herself and the nature of hope. And it's going to be again and again. It's going to get troubling, okay? I'm like, faith is a fine invention. Faith is a fine invention. That's an odd way to call faith for gentlemen who see. But microscopes are prudent um, in an emergency. That's very odd, okay? That's Dickinson's poetry, most of it, okay? So I'll leave it there, and I want you to look over the poems and read them over on both uh, Whitman and Dickinson. The other writer we're going to be doing, and I'll start him up um, probably by the end of the week, maybe early next week, um, is James Baldwin. He's a 20th century writer, and he is, if you have not heard of him before, he's extraordinary. One of the areas that Americans really contributed to literature was in nonfiction, especially in notions of civil rights. This began with Washington and Du Bois in the later part of the 19th century and in the early part of the 20th century. Um, they contributed much of what the world thinks um, civil rights are. It really did start in the late 19th and early 20th century with African-American writers. The world has basically follow, followed their lead. Um, what they write about did not begin, as many people confuse it. Most of what we think of as civil rights is not the Bill of Rights. It's radically different. When you talk to people about what they think their civil rights are, those ideas are indebted um, to the notions that uh, originated with Washington and Du Bois. Um, we're going to do James Baldwin, who's a 20th century writer, um, working much in that tradition. And he'll write about many of the figures he came encounter with, encountered um, in his time period, such as, uh, you know, the leaders of the civil rights movement who were a little more challenging. Um, and he'll go through and he meets them and he talks to them. And you'll see that in his letter um, from a region of my mind. This was a, a piece he had written in the late 60s about the civil rights movement, okay? So those are what we're going to be reading in the coming days. Take some time to read over the poetry. Um, that's from the 19th century, two poets who really did challenge the notions of what poetry is. And then we're going to get to um, uh, James Baldwin, who's a 20th century writer who's working in the 60s, writing about the nature of civil rights. 
Um, all these pieces are going to be challenging in one way or another, and then we'll be writing the essays. It's going to be essays. We're going to be doing three in-class essays on these three um, writers, okay? Um, three in-class style essays. You do not need to come to campus. I will be posting these assignments um, at the at the site um, in Canvas, okay? So we'll be doing, um, I will be posting essays, essay topics, and you'll be able to um, type them in and post, and you'll be done with it. They will follow much of the pattern um, that you probably are familiar with with an in-class style essay. Um, you will be able to sit down, write the essay, and be done with it probably within an hour for each one of them. Okay? So that's what we'll be doing. For now, concentrate on the readings. Give it your best. Jump in on Whitman and uh, Dickinson. Uh, give those your best, and I'll be posting videos on each of them. Take care.